Hello and welcome everyone to our latest presentation on COVID-19 associated pulmonary aspergillosis. Now, COVID-19 has been associated with aspergillosis and there have been a lot of case reports and case series. There have been two major meta-analyses which have been published till now. The first one by Mitaka, the second by Chong. They have included studies from Europe, Mexico, China, Pakistan and US with almost 3000 patients in Mitaka and 1400 in the Chong study. Now in this they tried to find the incidence and they found the incidence to be around 10%. However, there is a lot of controversy regarding the diagnosis. Now in these studies there were total 28 studies but routine screening for actually finding pulmonary aspergillosis was done in only 13 cases and there is also as we said a lot of problem with the definition and when to label a case as asper pulmonary aspergillosis in COVID-19 because there is a lot of variability in terms of criteria that have been used and the most commonly used criteria in this in all of these studies has been the NMAP ICU. Now Again, there has been a lot of difference also in terms of the pharmacological treatment given in critically ill patients with COVID-19, which could have affected people developing pulmonary aspergillosis, especially in terms of variability, in terms of the dosage of steroid, in terms of the immunosuppressive drugs that are being given. The diagnostic criteria for CAPA has been quite various. The most common, the European one, takes into uh, for integrated takes the host factors clinical factors and mycological evidence then there is the asp icu the modified asp icu the invasive uh, pulmonary aspergillosis criteria which is the most established criteria and finally the kappa one which has been a, a lot of variation of all these criteria which has been established now in terms of risk factors this is a study which had 366 patients out of this they found 21 patients who had uh, invasive pulmonary aspergillosis and they found dexamethasone and use of azithromycin as a significantly high risk factor for developing pulmonary aspergillosis apart from that tocilizumab is another important factor which has been found to be associated with increased incidence of pulmonary aspergillosis but then the case frequency is very less over here. Now, if we try to find the mortality associated with COVID-19, it has been quite significant. Almost 60% patients had died with COVID-19 who developed pulmonary aspergillosis. Now, the most important problem that had been faced during this COVID-19 pandemic for aspergillosis has been the diagnosis. We have this putative invasive pulmonary aspergillosis diagnosis which is established and it basically deals with taking lower respiratory tract cultures, compatible clinical picture with abnormal imaging findings and with host factors or positive semi-quantitative cultures or cytological smears. There is also the coronavirus associated pulmonary aspergillosis, the CAPA, that criteria. It has the biomarkers and imaging findings. Now, if we look at prevalence using the putative invasive pulmonary aspergillosis, the incidence would be around 17%. But if we take into account the CAPA, it would be around 30%. Similarly, the mortality with the putative one is 74%, while with CAPA, it is around 40 to 60%. Now, comparing the COVID infection with the influenza infection, the incidence of aspergillosis has been around 30%. The baseline characteristics in the influenza requires almost all these patients had to be have some sort of in, immunocompromise for developing aspergillosis. However, in corona infection, it is less than 10%. But we must keep in mind that these patients were receiving very high doses of immunosuppression as well. So we cannot rule out the role of immunosuppression in CAPA. Apart from this, male sex, obesity, hypertension and diabetes were important risk factors for aspergillosis. 
in influenza the incidence of aspergillosis was earlier between 3 to 7 days however in corona infection it was even beyond 14 days mycological findings were more commonly found in the influenza while they were less so in the corona infection now mostly it was tracheobronchitis with probable and proven cases with influenza but in kappa it is mostly putative cases the inflammatory response was a deleterious role of high il10 was found however in this a protective role of high tnf alpha was found role of corticosteroids till now we have not found a positive effect of corticosteroids in influenza infections however in covid-19 it is a standard of care right now in terms of mortality slightly higher mortality is seen in kappa with around 60 to 70% compared to 50 to 60% in influenza now how do we approach for the diagnosis of kappa the entry criteria is definitely has to be a sars cov 2 positive within 2 weeks of icu admission with suggested imaging findings like pulmonary infiltrates cavitary infiltrates or presence of both as you can see over here apart from that you need some mycological evidence for that you need to do a lung biopsy or a bronchoscopy a non bronchoscopic lavage a tracheal aspirate a sputum examination or a serum examination now this is where the real problem arises with covid infection because bronchoscopy is one of the most important methods for diagnosing this without doing bronchoscopy diagnosing aspergillus was the major concern over here now as it was a pandemic situation the availability of bronchoscope especially in a infected environment like that was discouraged so most of the studies are not backed up by a bronchoscopic based evidence lung biopsy though may be more proof is rarely ever done and so the most likely tests that were done were serum tests and sputum tests which may not be quite reflective of a patient actually having a aspergillus infection now coming to the treatment the most important drug that are to be given is voriconazole followed by amphotericin b isavuconazole posaconazole as a salvage therapy in type 2 diabetes mellitus voriconazole and posaconazole is given while it is suggested to go for isavuconazole and it is may not be necessary to give liposomal amphotericin b the duration of treatment has to be at least 6 weeks and can be extended up to 12 weeks follow up ct scan and serum and respiratory galactomanan must be done to follow up this treatment now if you look at the risk factor and associated mortality with covid-19 in this study they had around 170 cases and they found copd renal failure and age as major risk factors associated with covid-19 mortality now there have been cases even of triazole resistance kappa three cases have been reported till now all of them have resulted in death so we still don't know what actually works in these cases so to summarize the first thing that we need to do is when should we consider for kappa kappa must be considered in patients who are on ventilator for at least more than 5 days so we have to look for the host risk factors like high dose and long administration of steroids uh european society host or risk factor marker and a presence of structural lung disease a diagnostic worker of kappa is recommended in a clinically deteriorating patient with no other explanation or with cavitary or nodular lesions in ct scan the typical lesions such as the halo sign and the hypotense consolidation may be absent in the kappa bronchoscopic inspection of the airway is definitely warranted now how to diagnose bronchoscopy with ball is the recommended method which can include a transbronchial biopsy and not to rely on endotracheal aspirate and sputums for diagnosis microbiological investigation of ball including microscopy culture galactomanan or aspergillus pcr a positive culture with galactomanan index more than 1 is considered consistent with kappa it is recommended that azole resistant testing is detected in regions where aspergillus resistance to azoles is seen it is recommended to go for mucosal biopsy when plaques are visible in trachea and bronchi 
For serum galactomannan and beta D glucan, it is not recommended for patients monitoring due to low sensitivity. But when positive, it definitely indicates an advanced kappa. For serum beta D glucan, additional evidence of kappa is required as this marker is not specific for aspergillosis. In patients with cavitary lung lesions, it is recommended to exclude necrotizing pneumonia due to bacterial pathogens first because this is the most common thing that is going to happen that is the infection with strepto or staph before you jump into a diagnosis of fungus. Now how to treat? Antifungal prophylaxis is not recommended in mechanically ventilated patients. Consider empirical antifungal therapy in patients with visible plaques in trachea and bronchi. While awaiting for results of diagnosis of BAL in patients with a rapidly deteriorating clinical condition. And it is recommended as antifungal therapy in patients with confirmed IATB and positive BAL or galactomannan or aspergillus PCR. It is recommended to follow international treatment guidelines for choice of antifungals involving voriconazole as a first line therapy, isavuconazole and posagolazole as a salvage therapy. The diabetic patients must receive voriconazole and regarding stopping, it must be done if the galactomannan is negative or the culture is negative. Now there are a lot of things which still need to be clarified regarding first the epidemiology, the true epidemiology of kappa because most of the studies that have been done till now were not following a proper criteria. The frequency of IATB in kappa the identification of host and risk factors regarding diagnosis we need to find markers that discriminate aspergillus respiratory tract colonization with actual tissue invasion validation of aspergillus biomarkers determination of immune status of the patient now strategy is to find the role of antifungal prophylaxis management of covid 19 with positive upper respiratory tract cultures Regarding antifungal treatments, the benefit of nebulization in IATB, the role of liposomal amphotericin B in ICU settings, effects of sequestration and drug interaction of antifungals on exposure to ECMO and CRRT. Finally, the implications of antiviral and host-directed therapy for kappa risk and outcome. Host-directed therapy dampening and boosting of the immune response or both depending on the host's immune status. So to summarize, when you have an unexplained clinical deterioration on mechanical ventilation, you have to look for factors that may increase the probability of kappa. That is an immune suppressive medication, a positive aspergillus culture from respiratory tracts, a radiological sign suggesting a nodular or cavitary lesion, a serum galactomannan positive. If you find these or any one of these, you should go for a bronchoscopy. Inspect the large airways, try to find if there is any plaques or anything. If you find any plaques, take a biopsy. Do a ball, do a microscopy, fungal and bacterial culture, galactomannan, aspergillus PCR. Now, if you find the mucosal plaque or ulcer, a superficial biopsy has to be done. When contraindicated, go for a breast cytology. Look for fungal hyphae. If the fungal hyphae is positive, it is a diagnosed kappa, give antifungal therapy. If it is negative, then we go for tracheobronchitis or kappa has been excluded. Continue with preemptive antifungal therapy if you really feel it is important. Now, if the bal galactomannan is negative and the PCR is negative and the cultures are negative, you can exclude the diagnosis of kappa. Now, if you do not find any plaque, and then you must do more tests like you try to find aspergillus in the microscopy or the bowel fluid or the PCR. Then you have to go for, do for an azole test and based on if you live in a place where there is an incidence of azoles in aspergillus, finally you tailor your antifungal therapy. Thank you for your patience and check our website for further information.